Dr. Ruth Levine will now introduce this year's student class speaker, Dr. Levine. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to <clears throat> introduce our 2019 School of Medicine commencement class speaker, Mr. Henry Eidecker. <laughs> Mr. Eidecker was selected by his class to deliver the address. Mr. Eidecker received his Bachelor of Arts in Biology with a minor in Medical Humanities from St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. His honors included the Dr. Mark Holden Award for Humanism and Professionalism. He is a member and vice president of the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society and a member of the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Throughout his time at UTMB, Mr. Eidecker has volunteered at St. Vincent's Clinic and events such as the Texas Two-Step CPR Training, Defeat Breast Cancer Run, and Austin Middle School STEM Magnet Program Science Fair, where he was a judge. He also devoted his time to Hurricane Harvey relief efforts following the storm in 2017. Mr. Eidecker has been a student tutor since January of 2018, preparing materials and hosting weekly review sessions to help students prepare for the USMLE Step 1 examination. As a student researcher, Mr. Eidecker has shared his findings through poster presentations and manuscripts. Most recently, he was the first author on a project examining failure and shared airway management between anesthesiology and otolaryngology. That manuscript has been submitted for review by journal acceptance. Mr. Eidecker will be continuing his medical education at St. Louis University School of Medicine, where he, where he will be pursuing otolaryngology. Please join me in welcoming this exemplary student, Mr. Henry Eidecker. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Levine. And uh, I want to give a heartfelt and sincere thank you to all the administration, faculty, supporting staff, and personal mentors throughout my time at UTMB. These physicians have dedicated themselves to preserving the art and humanity of medicine so that we may go and do the same and represent UTMB proudly in doing so. Thank you to my mom and dad and my family who are here today. Um, I'm very grateful for you, and I love you very much. And, thankful, and thank you to uh, all the families and significant others here today. You have supported us in a goal that for many of us started a decade ago or longer. And your belief and encouragement in us are the reason we are here today. The day that that goal is finally coming to fruition. To my absolutely incredible classmates. <laughs> growing through medical school with you all, witnessing your accomplishments, and learning with you has been the biggest privilege of my life. And thank you for choosing me to speak to you today. Uh, I'm completely humbled and honored. I have to admit, when I saw my name on the screen, uh, you could probably tell from my face, I was hit with a wave of shock and, and nerves, as uh, there are quite a few more qualified people to be standing here. Um, and public speaking is really not my forte. But if there's one thing in medical school that I've learned, it's that you fake it till you make it. <laughs> and that is exactly what you are about to witness me do today. <laughs> Seeing as this speech is the last thing between us and uh, becoming doctors, my goal is to keep this brief, entertaining, and hopefully meaningful, to give the audience a small taste of what it's like to be in medical school, and for my classmates to reflect on what this past four years have meant. You fake it till you make it. I can't say that I've ever been particularly good at this. I really remember very fondly my first clinical experience. I was a wide-eyed first-year medical student showing the clinic with my new baggy, whitest of white coats, which really advertised to everyone in the room that this guy doesn't have a clue. <laughs> and in all reality, I really didn't have a clue. But I gave a nice little pep talk to myself and knocked on my first patient's door. Uh, trying to demonstrate an air of competence. 
And I will forever and fondly recall my first patient's first ever words to me. Are you 17? <laughs> I remember a teaching moment later that day uh, when I was actually Dr. Serpina, who's an incredible teacher, he was asking me my thoughts on the abundant etiologies of blood in the stool. A deer in the headlights, I looked at him, and I recall my robust differential diagnosis of hemorrhoids. <laughs> and that's all I had. I've grown quite a bit since first year. We all have. In fact, I don't think there's any period of four years where I've learned so much, not only about medicine, but also about myself and others. And this does not come without its growing pains. Truly, medical school is a very humbling four years, and formative too. And there's no experience quite as formative and humbling as figuring out what field of medicine you are most suited for and not suited for. So a little backstory: before uh, medical school started, my college roommate ambitiously bet me $100 that I would become an OBGYN. <laughs> and his justification was that, Hank, you appreciate the miracle of life too much to not be an OBGYN. I'm not really sure what he meant by that, but I had that conversation in mind as I began my OBGYN rotation in the most humbling year of medical school there is, the third year. So within the first 15 minutes of the first day of the rotation, I got tapped on the back by a midwife who asked me if I wanted to catch my first baby. And so I mustered all the enthusiasm I had at 5.30 that morning and gowned up to participate in probably the most surreal and hands-on experience of medical school thus far. And let me tell you, I did appreciate the miracle of life. I appreciated the heck out of it. And I'd like to take a moment to thank all the mothers who have gone through that <laughs> today. So I caught my first baby successfully and handed her to the mother. And the sight of the mom holding her firstborn was incredibly moving. And I thought, well, crap, maybe I'm at $100. Maybe OBGYN is my calling. The next few minutes just proved how wrong that thought was. <laughs> it was not long before the midwife turned to me and saw a ghost. Hank, you're looking a little pale. Are you all right? And that's the last thing I remember. <laughs> I woke up on the ground in the arms of the father <laughs> who, in a heroic act of participation in this miracle of life, had leapt from his chair and caught me. <laughs> Just as I had caught and delivered his daughter, so too did he catch and deliver me <laughs> to the nurse's station where I was fed orange juice. I can only imagine that little girl's birthday parties for the next few years when she hears the story of that nameless medical student that passed out after her birth. <laughs> and why am I telling this story to over 200 of my classmates and their families? Well, there are multiple reasons. The first, I think it's pretty funny, but also I think it's important to laugh at yourself sometimes, to own up to mistakes and, and learn from them. And medical school is all about learning and growth. And I hopped back on the horse that week and delivered more babies without passing out. Second, one of the most important privileges of medicine is getting to know and forming a relationship with your patients. Although that last story might not be the best example of that. In college, I took a class called Ethics and Geriatric Care. And I was paired with a nursing home resident named Mary, who I was supposed to visit throughout the course of that semester. And the purpose of this course was not to learn about her health or treatment plan. Rather, it was to instill the importance of getting to know your, your patient and forming a relationship with them. Ultimately, the class wanted me to ask her this question. What makes you famous? I thought it was a really strange question to ask, and I honestly wasn't a fan of the wording when I first heard it. But over the course of that semester, I began to learn its purpose. It, summons, it tends to summon a deeper response from the patient. It, what is her passion? What is a highlight of her unique life story? And I'll never forget Mary's response. Taking my mother in when she got sick, caring for her when she was most vulnerable, and being by her side when she left this world. Mary drew meaning and purpose from a selfless act of service, from putting a loved one before herself, and comforting someone in their most vulnerable state. And medicine, done the right way, is full of these moments. It's a life of service to which all of us have committed ourselves. And although not nearly as often as I should, I've asked a few UTMB patients this same question, what makes you famous? I've never regretted doing it. 
remember one patient in particular, he was an elderly man with dementia who had fallen and developed a brain bleed, was admitted to our service. And over the course of that week, we had rounded on him multiple times, morning and afternoon. And every time I came into the room, it was like I was meeting him for the first time. He never remembered me or mo most of the uh, treatment team. He was confused and without any family with him. And one day I decided that after work I would go up to him, talk with him, getting to know him and what makes him famous. The next morning on rounds was very similar to every other morning, except for one big difference. When I walked in that morning, he looked up, smiled at me, and said, how's it going, Hank? So what makes the class of 2019 famous? The compassion and dedication I've seen in my classmates inspires me every day. And it's often the little things. It's a small extra step that speaks volumes. I was walking to the gym one night and saw a peer coming back from the hospital late at night. And while this peer is a friend, up to that point, most of my conversations with him had been relatively superficial. And he previously struck me as a to the point and matter of, the fa matter of fact kind of guy. I was surprised to learn that he met a patient that morning on rounds who was by himself when he received a poor diagnosis. And so this peer chose to buy dinner that night, take it to the hospital, and eat with that patient. The parents of one of my best friends here at medical school had an unfortunate motor vehicle accident, were rushed to our emergency department, and were treated here in our hospital for a few days. One of our classmates happened to be working a shift in the emergency department that night. And upon seeing a fellow classmate's family go through this, she took it upon herself to show up on her day off the next day with a card, food, and her time. She had met them for the first time that night. I've seen my best friends work their tails off to accomplish a dream and to selflessly assist their peers in becoming the best doctors they can be. And I wouldn't be here without those same peers and their significant others. I have no shame in admitting that I was moved to tears witnessing peers accomplish this goal on match day. We are also the best dancers at Bliss and the best karaoke singers at Soundbar, and I hope to see some of you there tonight. I'll be singing Blink-182's What's My Age Again, and it's not 17. Finally, um, during residency interviews, somebody once asked me what my proudest moment is. And if I could answer that again, I'd say, it's right now. It's speaking about the accomplishments of the most incredible people I've had the privilege of getting to know, calling friends and future colleagues. Never forget what makes you famous, your effect on the patients you come across, and the incredible impact of that small extra step. I'm going to miss you guys quite a bit, and uh, thank you so much. I'm, I couldn't be here without you all. So let's go be doctors. Thank you, Mr. Attaker, and congratulations.